It is terrific to see so many people here. Obviously, there's a great interest in offshore racing, but I think it's also testament to the great panel we have here this evening. There is a lot of offshore racing experience um, uh, on our panel tonight, and I'll introduce them in a minute, but first let me introduce myself and what's going to happen this evening. So, my name is Elaine Pickering, and one of the things that I'm involved in is something called steering the course. So you may have seen that was a banner that um, headed up our um, conversation this evening. Steering the course is something that was initiated by World Sailing, which you'll know is the uh, world governing body on sailing. And it was initiated actually originally to bring communities of women sailors together um, for the, those who are accomplished to appreciate them and learn from them and those who are new to the sport to encourage them and give them a network of people that they could um, be in touch with and, and get to know. Um, and we hold a sailing festival in May every year which is ably um, managed and put on by Hebe Haven Yacht Club. And those of us who went from Royal Hong Kong this year to participate felt it was such a great learning experience, it was great to network with people and to learn that we wanted to keep the momentum going. And so tonight is our inaugural uh, um, event to, to do that, to bring community of the sailing, the sailing community together um, to share those who are new to offshore racing to learn and those who have, have participated before to share. Um, so it's, I'm really thrilled that we have the panel that we have tonight to kick us off on this series of events. Um, Lucy Sutro, you'll all know as our Commodore. Lucy was extremely brave in my opinion. Uh, she had her first offshore racing experience in April this year on the China, Co uh, China Sea Race. Um, she went from double-handed flying 15 sailing in the harbor to jumping <laughs> off the deep end and, and getting on a big boat and going down to the Philippines. So she's got a lot of fresh experience being a newbie to offshore racing to share with us tonight. Nick Southard is our current, sorry you guys who might um, have been offshore racing before, but he's our current hero at the club in offshore racing <laughs> as he and his crew on, on Whiskey Jack uh, won the... the <laughs> yes. Let's have a look at the watch. <laughs> that's the coveted watch. He doesn't get to share it either. That's his to keep. Um, and him and his crew won the, the China Sea Race this year. Um, but he's also just returned from Fastnet uh, in the UK, which those of you who are not familiar with that race, it's from the Solent out to a rock just off um, the south of Ireland and then off to Cherbourg. It's about 630 nautical miles or whatever. 690. And uh, it's great he's here to tell the tale because if anyone was tracking that, a lot of people uh, retired this year. The, the weather conditions were, were pretty scary, to say the least. Lawrence Mead, welcome back. Uh, to Hong Kong. Lawrence is a, was a member here, and he grew up um, in Hong Kong, learned uh, to sail on dinghies out of Middle Island, and um, has done lots, got lots of offshore racing experience, coastal racing experience, lots of experience sailing. Um, he has just stepped down as a uh, director of Cows Week, where he was there for six years. And uh, I'm sure you've all heard of Cows Week, but you may not know it's actually the largest regatta of its kind in the world. So uh, welcome back, Lawrence. Really good to see you. I know you're just here for a short time to sail in the, this weekend's China Coast Regatta. So thanks for being with us tonight. Sandra Stell is all the way in from Hebe Haven Yacht Club. <laughs> Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, Sandra has also got a lot of offshore racing experience, including um, she has sailed a number of legs on the clip around the world. Again, for those of you who don't know what that is, that is a 40,000 nautical mile race around the world, taking in all different parts of the world and lasting generally for, what, about nine months or something? Yeah, so thanks for joining us tonight as well, um, Sandra. And Inge Stromf, uh, again, former Commodore. I wish I could read her CV of all the offshore racing she's done, but I think probably your biggest claim to fame is you've done 30 
China Sea races. So uh, again, lots of experience here tonight. So we, we're going to start off by just seeing a little clip to get your appetite wetted for offshore racing. And I'll just point out one thing about this. Uh, take a look at the helm on this race, and we'll mention about the that person. That that. <laughs> Sorry? The helm that does that. Yeah. Two OK, all right. Yeah? No, I'll move out of the way. joy of arriving. So Sandra, real quickly, who was, tell us something about the helm on that. Okay, the um, helm on that boat was an amazing lady called Nikki Henderson. Um, Nikki is amazing for a number of reasons. She was 23 when she took on the job of helming that 70 foot yacht um, all the way around the world, turned 24 during the, um, during the event. Um, the other thing about Nikki is that she came in overall in second place on that race. So out of 12 helms, there were two women. Um, one came in first and Nikki came in second, which was pretty impressive. Um, the other thing about Nikki is that she did not start with a team of champions. Everybody in that race on her crew was an amateur sailor, some with experience, others with minimal experience. 
Um, and what Nikki had the amazing ability to do at such a young age was to actually make a champion team. And that's how those guys won that race. So um, a very impressive woman. Great, thank you. So um, we're not all 23. We're, uh, <laughs> some people will have looked at that video and thought, God, oh, I can't wait to get out and do that. But other people, I saw their faces, it was like, oh my God, I'm never going to do offshore racing. But um, when I look at that, I mean, it kind of brings back memories of just sailing around ballast or, or off Saikung somewhere in the Typhoon series. So Nick, what can you tell us a little bit about what, what's the distinction between, say, day racing in those kind of conditions or offshore ocean racing? Okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, this, this section of the talk in our rundown uh, was titled, What is Offshore Racing? And, and um, for me, Offshore racing is the best possible es escape. It means no emails, no phones, no distractions, no contact with the outside world. No, I'm not going to say no wife. <laughs> <laughs> it just means a few days of getting back to nature, the basics. Uh, and you can just focus on sa sailing, pure fo focus, sailing, racing and doing nothing else and that really is an experience that can't be beat, beaten so it's very very different from uh, doing a Sunday afternoon typhoon se series race in uh, Ho Hong Kong here where it's 32 de degrees it's baking hot there's no wind and you're just sort of um, dr dr drifting around that so that's not that's not really sailing. Uh, it's a lot of the type of sailing that we do here, but it's not really sailing compared to go, going offshore. Um, so, you know, our, our opportunities to go offshore are fairly limited here, um, and uh, but I try to take every opportunity I can because it is a fantastic escape. Great, thanks. So. Um, there is a distinction, though, between, say, offshore racing that's ocean racing and coastal racing. Lawrence, do you want to...? Yeah, I think, it, I think you've, you've uh, highlighted that point very well about uh, getting away from emails. You can do that on a 60-foot cruising catamaran and get away from emails just as well without having to go upwind in a monohull for four days. Um, but the, I think that the, the, uh, offshore for me is anything that's overnight. A lot of that was ocean, say, it was ocean racing. And you can do an offshore. We used to have back in the, uh, in the early 80s here in Hong Kong, we used to have an offshore series. I think it, was, I think it might have been six races in the year, you might remember. But it was six nights. We started on a Friday night or a Saturday lunch. No, we started at Saturday lunchtime right here in front of the club. And we went out around Soko Islands and Pedro Blanco Rock. And I mean, six times a year, overnight. And we would finish back here on a Sunday afternoon or something. And that were, they were proper offshore races. You had to stand the watch. You had to eat at night. You had to you know, sail at night. You had to have a torch on the telltales. And we had some, some windy races. If you do one of those in March, uh, you'll feel like you're on an offshore race. You won't feel like you're on an ocean race. And you won't feel like you've done the fast net race, which this year was just ridiculously brutal. Um, but you will have done an offshore race. So I think offshore and ocean are two different things that it's worth getting your head around. OK, Sandra, do you want to add anything to that? Other than no, I agree. I think they you know, have a lot of fun races here that are overnight and passage races. Um, you don't have to do that stuff. I'm just not normal. Um, so <laughs> I think, yeah, no, I think it's a very good point. You can enjoy being offshore um, without having to go to extremes. Yeah, we have an offshore series in the UK run by Royal Ocean Racing Club, which is about eight races a year. Half of them start on a Friday night and half start on a Saturday morning. And they're 130 miles to about 220. And the longer ones take place over a bank holiday weekend. And they're proper offshore races. You know, you feel like you've, um, you've been out and done a couple of nights at sea. Uh, I mean, ocean racing is a whole different ball game. I mean, anyone who does ocean racing, what was it, how do you describe yourself? A bit nuts. <laughs> ocean racing is, is proper nuts. If you decide you're going to do 3,000 miles in one go on a boat, 
I'm going to give you Cathay Pacific's number because it's a way better way to get from A to B is on a bloody jet. <laughs> so, Ingi, what what would you say is the difference really between racing when you're going offshore or, or ocean sailing and if you're just cruising, which you've just you and Ing, uh, Lucy have just come back from? Sorry, that was my first cruise, so I'm not very experienced with that. <laughs> but if I should describe, uh, let's say, the offshore racing, let's say we go to the Philippines, which is still relatively close to shore everywhere. Um, I think the greatest about it is you go into a zone and you are there with your teammates and everyone has to help each other and it's it's this special feeling and it's, it takes about 24 hours and after that it's just amazing you get into a routine and things so uh, what was the other question? Well it was just really uh, you know the difference between cruising I mean I know there's some people here tonight who said I don't want to go offshore racing but I'd want to cruise down to the Philippines or whatever um, I can, what's different I can say what we did on the cruise just now uh, Lucy and I we went a hardship on an Oyster 56 cruising in the uh, Chesapeake Bay area. It was organized between the International Council of Yacht Clubs and the Annapolis Yacht Club. And they had then hooked up with four small yacht clubs in the bay. So we would only be sailing during the day. And I think on average, max, max 20 miles, uh, usually only 10 miles. And then cocktail hour was at five on shore somewhere and then a few nights we would go into town eat on our own but there were a lot of organized uh, buffets and uh, very social i think we had we must have had six countries a uh, hundred people uh, 30 boats uh, so it was quite interesting organized cruises we used to have one of those in hong kong at the end of the season it was called a booze cruise <laughs> Nick. Yeah, so um, for me, uh, the the difference between offshore racing and cru 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 cruising is quite simple. On the race down to the Philippines, you you it takes four days, and you don't sleep for four, four days, and it's full on ra racing. Uh, you're f focused on the boat. You're focused on looking after your crew. It's just full on. The delivery trip back is about five times better. Because you're going back in good weather, because you choose the weather w window, so it's nice w w w weather, whereas on the way down, you have to deal with what gets thrown at you. So you're going back in, in good, good weather, so it's sunny, you're relaxed, you've got music playing, you're f fishing off the back, um, you kind of do lurch from cocktail hour to cocktail hour, and, and it's a very enjoyable trip. So for me, perhaps, I almost enjoy the delivery trips back more than the, the actual race. OK, thanks. So Lucy, this was your first experience of offshore racing. Can you share a little bit about what you experienced on the boat and creature comforts or lack thereof? Yeah, well, <clears throat> so it was all very different from the Flying 15 that I'm so used to. Um, and let me think, life on a boat, um, well, there are lots of things uh, that I had to learn about. Number one, actually, interestingly enough, was that I discovered that even though I thought I did not get seasick, I did get seasick. So take those seasick pills with you. Um, number two, the joys of hot bunking. Uh, number three, the... Oh, and not having your own bunk. You come off watch and you sleep where you can. Um, um, uh, what else would be on the list? Um, oh, the importance of food, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm probably not. I'm, uh, yeah, the importance of food. And the interesting, whether it's whether you've got the sweet urge or whether you've got the salty urge, but, but food is critical in all of this when you've got waves crashing over you and all the rest of it. Have the right kit. I don't know. I could go. I could go on. I mean, a massive learning experience. And actually, but what I should say at the end of all of this is the kindness and the generosity and the bond that you build with your crew, in particular with your watch, is is just remarkable. It's wonderful. Kind of real, real high point in my life, actually. So, anyone else? What what can you get on to? An, you managed to get on the crew of an offshore race and what can you expect to experience? Well, I, on, the, on the basis of this was originally set up as a 
not as a women's talk, but as a talk for to encourage women into offshore sailing. I think Lucy hit a very important point, which is don't be put off by the uh, either the macho image of it, or don't be put off by the practicalities of being a woman on a boat full of men. I'm trying to talk, dance around the subject a little bit here, but you know, uh, you, you have to just carry on with life and all its bodily functions, and no one cares. It's a race. And as Nick said, when you are racing, you're focused on the sails, the telltales, the boat speed, whatever it is. And being a woman on a boat, frankly, these days, is just like being a crew member on a boat. It doesn't. I've sailed with a lot of women in, in the last 20 years. Uh, I sailed here with a woman who, who owned an etcher with, she partnered with my brother, and I used to sail that sometimes. And if you go to land in an etcher as a woman, you have got to have a pee at some point during the day. And the answer is you go down, at, hidden away underneath the cubby as much as you can, you pee in a bucket and chuck it over the side. In the UK, I sailed with a guy who's new to sailing in the late 50s. New to sailing, he's always wanted a race, and uh, was blowing 25 knots in a couple of years ago. We all needed a, a pee in the middle of the day, and uh, I said, well, just go in the, in the bottom of the boat. He said, well, no, I can't. Then, you know, I said, just mate, there's no way you're going on the deck to have a pee. People die. I mean, the number one way people die on boats is with their trousers down. <laughs> it's a genuine fact. It's a genuine fact. You go and you think, okay, I can have a pee over the side. Nowadays, you've got zips. But back in the day, you fall over, and that's when people die. So just do it in the bottom of the boat. If it's 25 knots anyway, there's so much spray and water flowing over, it washes away in 30 seconds, 10 seconds. So you do have to get your head into a slightly different place, which is to move away from the niceties of shore and just enjoy bonding with the crew and enjoying being out there. But for women who, who are thinking of it, and I'm, I'm sure you can talk about this subject, don't, don't be put off by the practicalities of, of life. Yep, totally agree. There's absolutely no room for modesty if you're interested in racing on a boat. Um, if you don't feel comfortable peeing in a bucket or... Um, I. I but think Lawrence is... No, I, I'll <laughs> stop there. But um, there's no need to be modest. It's just everybody... It's a level playing field when you're out there. I don't think there's any specific male-female differences. <laughs> you just got to get on with it and realise that you're all there as a team. I think uh, Lucy raised a really good point about teamwork. Um, I think that is one of the most engaging um, aspects of offshore racing in particular. You do get to bond with the team of people that you're working with and whether that's a team of two or a team of 20 it doesn't matter you share the rewards you share the tough moments um and you actually have to make an, an effort to um to, to succeed the one thing i will mention that lucy raised was something that is seriously overlooked that i've discovered on most of the ocean races that i've done is the issue of seasickness for some ridiculous reason, I'm blessed not to suffer from that, regardless of the conditions, and that's a blessing. And I think it's a rarity, but it's just a subject that isn't discussed well enough before people get on boats. If you have never done a race before and you don't know what your likelihood of seasickness is, you really do need to get on a program of seasickness management before you get on that boat. Um, apart from being a horrible experience for the person that suffers from it, it's horrible for the rest of the team because a seriously seasick person is a totally dysfunctional person. They're just completely out of it. There's no way they can be a functional member of a team when they're really affected. Yep. So. Sandra, on that note, I can tell, tell you a, a, a small, quick sto story. So um, maybe 2009, I did, did the same Fernando race, and, and my trick, I start to take seasickness pills two days b beforehand, you know, half dose, uh, and then I take a, a full dose the night before the race, and then keep, keep on throughout the first two days of the race. So, as you know, going to the F Philippines, the first 100 miles can be the most unpleasant, painful exp experience, because it's a really short, choppy sea when, when it's windy, the boat gets thro thro thrown around. So as we're sailing out, I turn around to the rest of the crew, who, who were basically a bunch of testosterone-driven 50-year-old males, and I said to them, so who else has been taking seasickness pills? And they all looked at me, what? You know, why? I don't need seasickness pills. Um, and I went, oh, okay, all right. So we went out. The first hundred miles, I'm off watch, and I suddenly hear, hear a, a voice which went, I've got no steering. 
And so uh, I sort of scramble out of bed and go, go, go up to, to find that, yeah, the steering had broken. And this boat was being tossed around in, in that chop in 30 knots of breeze. And it was a Benito, it was a big, big boat, very heavy, and it was just being slammed, slammed around, and we couldn't con control it because there, there was no steering. And within the space of five minutes, the six other blokes on this crew were almost catatonic with seasickness. They, they were just sit, sitting in the co cockpit, slumped like this. And uh, I was trying to talk to the uh, owner about, well, where do I find this piece of gear so I can fix the ste steering? And um, I, I couldn't get a, a, an answer out from, from him because he, he, he was just too seasickness. So to cut a long sto story short, it took me three hours, but I did fix the self ste the steering, and we carried on ra racing. But these guys were sick for the next two days, and 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 it it, it, it really was a serious qu question: Do we turn back now? And and with only one functioning person on the boat, should we turn back? You know, is that the right thing to do? Or the fact is, well, we've got to another. We've got to go back in another hundred miles of that unpleasant stuff, which is going to make them feel even worse. Or do we ca carry on? So in the end, we ca carried on. After two days, they were back to normal. But you know, if you don't take your seasick sickness pills and you get seasickness, it, you get seasick. It doesn't end immediately. It just goes on and on and on. So I really recommend the seasickness stra strategy. Yeah, I only, only, um, only add to that, that that there are different levels of seasickness. You're, I get seasick for the first night of each season, and then after that I'm usually okay. My son gets seasick almost every time he goes out and does an offshore race for, for a couple of hours in the evening. Um, he did the single-handed transatlantic race from England to Newport, Rhode Island, 3,200 miles on his own, and he was seasick for the first three days. And somebody uh, who'd done the race many times said to him, you know, it is mind over matter. You have to say to yourself, I cannot be catatonic. I have to be, keep going. Okay, I'm sick. But if you allow it to take over your mind, then you become dysfunctional. If you throw up and then say, okay, I'll throw up and keep going. Now, some people get seriously sick. And if you do, then, you know, you, you, you are in a difficult place for sure. Um, but I would only just say that there are, you, you, you have to find out what, <laughs> this sounds really unpleasant, doesn't it? You have to find out what level of sickness you suffer from, really. Um, to to be able to manage that process properly. But a lot of it is demanding of yourself that you do continue to be a functioning person while you're throwing up. But I, I, I have seen people who've thrown up for three days and, and in the end just can't cope with it. And they become dehydrated and it becomes a proper medical problem. Um. I also think mind over matter. Uh, I've been radio operator for, I think, the last 12 years on the China Sea Race, and I also navigate, so I'm sitting a lot downstairs at the chart table, and uh, my mental, uh, first of all, I will myself into doing it, and then I bring a bucket down, and this bucket, even though I've never used it, it's my mental strength that I know if everything goes wrong, it's there, and so far, so good. <laughs> Uh, one, more, one more thing maybe to the creature comfort also, uh, I think bringing the right clothes, um, in the beginning we were all running around in pyjamas uh, because in the summer heat it's loose, it's comfortable and once you get uh, sunburned it's really, really bad. So uh, protection is really important. And one more thing which is another specialty which is called gunnel bum is uh, make sure you bring wet wipes or something, even if the boat has no water. But if you're sitting with a wet bum in the salt water for an extended time, you'll get like a baby rash, and it will be absolutely painful. So I think keep that bum dry and clean. So it, 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 on that note, I mean, you, you saw the video with that, those big waves in... The South, South, Southern Ocean or somewhere? Nick, or? that was the North Pacific. North Pacific, okay. 2018. But even there, I'm sure it was pretty cold in, in that kind of storm. And, and uh, I, I can't, when you're in those conditions, I can't stress enough how 
important it is to be warm and dry. And, and when you're in those conditions, if you don't have good offshore protective gear, you'll be there saying, you know, I will pay anything, any money, to, to uh, have a, a set of warm gear. And, and so, for example, when I did the first net race, this year, I, I went and bought a new set of offshore gear, a, ja a jacket and top, twelve hundred pounds. So, and and, and I know I was going to get get into trouble, <laughs> but that is what it costs. That is what it costs to to be comfortable and not to have gun and bum and to. Um, to you know, have the best chance of enjoying the race. If you're cold and wet, you will ha hate it. If you're warm and dry, uh, it, it gives you a much, much better experience. So you just hate it a little bit less. You just hate it a little bit less. <laughs> My son calls it type two fun. You know you've had fun, but only after the at the time. So, what does it, um, I was going to say that um, I've had it drummed into me at home by Nigel, my husband. If you're wet, you're cold. That's all he says. And so um, the mission, I mean, it was very hard to stay dry in those sorts of conditions. But um, between us, we did a lot of research and a lot of sourcing of gear. And that made a 100% difference. The previous race I'd done was a Southern Ocean race um, when I didn't have, it was probably my first big offshore race. Um, I was using the clipper provided gear, which was good gear, very good quality, but it just wasn't suitable for taking waves over your head constantly. And so the next time around, um, gear made absolutely every difference. My core stayed dry. So all of the inside of my outers, everything inside was dry, so I was warm. But the people that weren't dry were absolutely frozen. That race started at the tail end of winter from Qingdao, um, it was absolutely Baltic. We went north, it was hailing, it was snowing, it was freezing cold and we were taking a lot of water. So being dry and warm was a lifesaver, to be honest. Um, so I really couldn't agree more about that. Right, so preparing, you need to take your seasick pills, you need to buy the right gear. You mentioned food, what kind of food are you taking on board? The first few days, you bring uh, something you can have in plastic bags in your pocket because when it's blowing 40 knots, no one wants to go down. Uh, there are some hardened fellow sailors who do it, and they will make the coffee. Uh, and tea list is important. Make sure you have a list of all the crew members, how they like it, so you don't need to ask up. So how many sugars, how much milk are black. Uh, food also, the first few days, we make stews and we take them out of the um, out of the freezer and heat it up and then hand it up in big cups so that people can basically sit on the rail and eat. That's the only way to go. No one wants to go down. Uh, and the best, of course, is when we are in the Philippines and it's bloody hot down there. We bring out the oranges that we have put into the freezer. And so they come out frozen and we cut them in wedges and that is heaven. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, food, um, food, food is very important. Um, and I think the easiest way to get onto a boat is to say that you'd be very keen to help with the food. <laughs> Uh, that's that's really important, um, and so we did something new that this year for for, for the fa fast net. I've never. Been, I mean, pre pre previously we've cooked stews, we've fro frozen them, we've ta taken them out, we've he he heated them up in the pan. Uh, I, I've tried freeze dried food before, but it, it is absolutely revolting, and, and I, I, I can't can't eat it. Um, so. For the first night this year, what we did was to cook our stews and our food and stuff. And I went and got one of these vacuum pack sealer things, sous vide, I think it's called. Yeah. And so each uh, meal, we uh, I cooked and then vacuum packed it straight straight away, and then fro froze that va vacuum pack. And uh, so uh, uh, and that went with. Everything, all the food we had was va vacuum packed and stuck stuck in the fridge. With and I think we had a, a 
four big bottles of frozen water in the bo bottom, and then all the frozen stuff, and then, then all the non-frozen stuff. But it was all that vacuum packed. So when you have a meal, uh, it, it was fantastic because you take your frozen pa packet out, out of the fridge, you know, your stew or, or whatever, stick it into a pan of boiling water, you boil it for fi five minutes until, until it's hot. You then eat it, so, so, so you eat this food, and then you've got a bit of hot water for the washing up. It was just per perfect. So, it really was. so ne next time we're, we're going to we'll do this frozen food, you know, this vacuum packed food, <laughs> <laughs> or anyone else who wants to come and be, be the cook. <laughs> um, but on the subject of food, I think it becomes most critical when you're the lucky person who's got the two o'clock to five o'clock in the morning watch. And at that point, and and it, uh, and you know, uh, and the and the the uh, the race down to the Philippines is lucky because the moon is normally out uh, normally out by that time. But anyway, it's a grim time of the day in the best of times, and it's doubly grim when you've got big seas and big winds around you. Um, and um, and then, in my view, it's all about sugar, with a certain amount of salt. So I, I found. Uh, so we had a watch of three, um, and the two boys on my watch were very much in the sugar category. I found myself much more in the salt category, but but it was it was all about just this constant flow of carbs, fat, sugar, salt, and that's what keeps you going in those nasty hours in the middle of the night. Again, creature comfort. Um, the, we have pockets sitting on the side as you come down the stairs. Uh, if you are up overnight, you have the full regalia on with uh, foul weather gear and the life jacket and uh, the leash and the whole thing. Is If you go down and sleep, it's, you will rest better if you actually take all the wet clothes off, hang it up and lie down. And then when you start again, you put it on and you feel warmer going back up. So it's really important having the organization on the boat that you have each uh, life jacket marked from 1 to 12, which we had, and where you hang your stuff. So it's organization on the boat, because uh, if not, after a few days, and you sit down in your foul weather gear, and you can basically have the whiff coming up, you must keep that clean. <laughs> So um, to, you prepared yourself, you've got your food, your seasick pills. Uh, how do you psychologically prepare for an offshore race? I've never had time because I'm busy, <laughs> busy preparing the boat, getting ready. So, so, and that's such a rush. And it's such a, it takes so long uh, to get the boat ready. That, to be honest, it's... It's really the only thing I said this year was that on the start of the race, I wanted to be finished completely the day before. So on the morning of the start, I could arrive here, walk up to, to the bar, have a c coffee, and gradually walk down to to the boat, and then get get in and go. Um, uh, but so yeah, that that that's sort of my psychological approach. So you're, you, you've done a lot of offshore racing. Lucy, how did you prepare psychologically, never having done it before? Well, to be honest, I didn't because I didn't know what I was going into. Uh, absolutely no idea what I was going into. So I spent, my preparation was to try and find something that would keep me busy so that I didn't actually have time to think about this just giant unknown that I was going into. So I went round making sure that all the food was put away in lockers and, you know, generally trying to be useful. I, I had no idea what I was going into. And now that you do have an idea, would you prepare any differently? No, I, I mean, I don't know what you do to prepare. I mean, n knowledge is really helpful, um, and I now have that. I now know what I'm roughly what you are about to experience. You need to have trust in your boat, and you need to have trust in your crew, and you need to have trust in your kit. And, and I now know I have all three of those, and that would give me the reassurance that I just didn't have because I didn't know what I was doing. So, okay. yeah, trust your crew, trust your boat. I totally agree with that, Lucy. Um, I think the f 
Ignorance is bliss the first time you do something like that because you have no idea. Um, it's exciting. Uh, it might be the first time you try it and you, yeah, it's, it's very exciting. I have to say though, um, it's quite hard to prepare psychologically sometimes when you don't know anybody that you're going to be sailing with. And in both two editions of the Clipper Race that I did, the first one um, was the Southern Ocean Adventure and the Sydney to Hobart. But the second one, I was much more clued into what to expect. And somehow that made it a little bit easier, but it was 30 days of brutality. Um, and I think what it did come down to was the people I was sailing with, um, just cracking on with it. And I think you have to really pull on a lot of resilience, to be honest with you. I think we are all hired, hardwired to be resilient and probably don't realize how resilient we are until we're thrown into that sort of situation. I always found the second night at sea the hardest night to deal with because I would just be standing there and it was just constant. Four hours on, four hours off, but of that four hours off, you probably got about two hours sleep if you were lucky. Um, and by the second night, I thought, holy hell, I've got 30 days of this. Or how, it's just, this is just going to go on and on and there's no way out. There's no way off and there's no way out. And that's when you have to draw on what you're really made of. Yeah, I would say um, if, you've never, if you've never done it and want to do it, just do it. As long as you're not going with a whole bunch of people who've not done it before, you will survive. It'll work. It'll all work out. That's just going to happen. If you go with Ian and Rick, um, you know, back in the day, you were going with highly competent people who were going to be, you know, well, well, well prepared and you're going to have a good race. Just go. Don't worry about it. Just go. We've, we're back in the, in the 80, early 80s, we used to look at the China Sea Race as if, you know, we all might die because it hadn't been done that many times. I mean, 82, I'm thinking of, and the forecast for the first 18, 20 hours were very windy. And we're all sitting around the bar thinking, oh, are we going to survive? Are we going to die? 99% of the time you come back, and we'll talk about safety a, a, a bit later. Yeah, not 100%, but we will talk about clipping on, I hope. Um, so just go. But it is about mental resilience, for sure. There was a program about survival on in the UK, and my wife and I were watching it a while ago. And this couple got dropped into the middle of the jungle or the desert or somewhere or another. And on the first night, one of the two, I won't say which one because it was mainly women, but one of the two said, oh, I don't think I can do this. And I turned around to my wife and said, what a loser. They won't make it. That's it. They won't make the whole week that they're supposed to be out there. And she said, you don't know that. They're just getting used to the situation. I said, no, they've given up. On the first night, they won't make it. Next morning, they wanted to be helicoptered out. If you don't decide that you are going to do it, or you're going to give it, you know, and, and you said actually the right thing, once you're out there for 30 days, on the second night, there isn't any way off anyway. If you're going to go to f the Philippines, you're just going to have to, 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 to t tough it out, to lump it. So mental resilience is just super important. And you may not enjoy a lot of it. I came out of Sydney in the Sydney Hobart race once, and we had to go upwind in a southerly to Hobart for the first 28 hours. And I remember thinking, I wonder if I can lean forward and pull the pin out of the shroud so the mask falls over, because I'm going to we'll be able to go back. It was a 60-foot yacht, so there was quite a lot of load on the pin at the time. <laughs> but anyway, I couldn't do that, so I had to sit there for, for, for six days. Um, but, you know, you do get there. That, that's the point. But you do need to, to, to just be ready to say, uh, I will do the next 28 days because I haven't got any bloody choice. Mental preparedness. Uh, I've been going on to some of these races totally stressed because you're trying to finish projects and you're trying to do things. That's the worst way of going because it, it takes you almost two days just to calm down with the mind. So I think actually trying to get good sleep a, a few, maybe a week in advance and just take it easy is, is a, a much better way of doing it. For me also, I uh, often go and check all the communication systems and doing the tests that they like us to do, make sure all our e work and our personal e work and uh, that we've called in and tested the radio and because if things go wrong then there's still many ways out. So mental preparedness, um, what next? <laughs> Sorry, I, I was thinking about something else there. Uh, qualifications needed, yes, on the boat. You do have to have certain qualifications. Nick, Ingi, shall I start off with that? Because yeah. I made some notes on that. Um, uh, with all of that, it's safety first. 
And uh, so for any owner having to get the boat ready, it's becoming more and more difficult because the regulations have uh, tightened up and the cost implications is a whole other one. And uh, we are following the Category 1 uh, ROC, which is the uh, Royal Ocean Racing Club's uh, regulations, which has been adopted worldwide. And you can see with every event that went wrong, like uh, the Fastnet race in 79, um, uh, Oakland to Suva, I think there were quite a few boats that uh, uh, sunk and people died and uh, of course Sydney to Hobart every time it gets stricter and stricter and the club uh, sends out scrutineers so it will take you at least I think three weeks to get the boat ready you then need certificates for your rating so that's in order you need to get uh, measurement certificates for uh, for your sales and um, that's more on the boat side. For the crew, um, we are now obliged to have 50% of the crew that has done the safety at sea course. Uh, we also need to do first aid, at least 30% of the crew. And I must say, having to redo them every two or three years is actually really healthy because I forget a lot, and I'm sure many other people do too. Uh, safety at sea, I think, is interesting because we learn first aid. But the problem is on the boat, after the first aid, there is no second aid. So that we actually have to go a little bit more deeper in. And uh, in our time, we've uh, been buying big medical kits with books. And uh, we've been lucky that we've had a doctor on the boat for many years uh, who then could also help other boats and other people in the Philippines when we came down. So I think that's really important. So on the personal side, all the position that you get assigned or you choose. Uh, the PVOL, which is a private vessel operator's license. Uh, so if you have a grade two, you can, uh, you can basically be the skipper for a boat up to 15 meters. Grade one is, I think, uh, limitless. Uh, so if you're on a bigger boat, you need a bigger license. And as a girl, if I can go, to back, go back on that, I was usually the only girl in the 70s and 80s on the boat. And all the hotshot racers, none of them had any certificates. So for me to guarantee I would get onto the boat, sure, I have grade one. Sure, I have a, a radio operator's license. Sure, I have done plenty of navigations. Yes, I'm a yacht master offshore. So that's all the courses that would be good to to do, but personally, it's been good because I got the ticket onto the boat. Nick, did you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I, I would say uh, the, yeah, the, the strict qualification for, for the crew is 50% of the crew have to do the safety at sea course. Uh, for me, I would really want everyone to have done, to, done that. Uh, it, it is, it's a good, very instructive course, um, and, and it does especially the current instructor, he does um, instill the fear of God into you, makes you question why you're do doing it. <laughs> so uh, I think that's, that's very, very important. People have got to realize that, that when they're going offshore, it is a serious thing. Um, it's fun, yeah, you have a great, great time, but it, it can, can also be serious, so you've got to be educated into to that. Um, and we do run those courses at the club. Yes. Obviously. We yep. run the world sailing courses at the club. Yeah. Yep. Um, and other qualifications are just being really keen to get in and do, to do things. As I said, the guy, um, uh, anyone willing to go in and cook? <laughs> you're on. <laughs> we had an issue on one trip with an exploding holding tank. That wasn't very nice. And there was one guy on, on the boat who was straight in, in the clear, clearing everything thing, thing up. He's on the boat for, forever because <laughs> of that, that type of uh, c commitment. So, so yeah, just, just being keen is... is um, and also, I think, uh, helping to take... So as skipper, you, 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 know, you carry a huge amount of responsibility 
responsibility for, for your crew. You know, you are essentially responsible for, for them and the decisions that, that are ta taken. And, and um, having a crew who understand that um, is, is re re really good. Um, you know, some, sometimes you, you can have crew who will ask a huge amount of quick questions, just non-stop questions, and um, the answer to, to those quick questions are always there, like, you know, how does the toilet work? How does, where's the key for, for the gas? Where, where's the gas switch? You know, those kind of fundamental things um, are, are things that you know, people can come on board and, and uh, make themselves aware of all that in, info and, and so so having people who who can do that really takes a weight off your mind i'm, I'm going to try and thread a very fine line between um uh, uh, tr uh, it, it, b believing people should do the courses which i think absolutely 50 percent should um but also actually the best way to do it is just to go out and do one night you know, I think we're maybe slightly getting ahead of ourselves here, where we're saying, okay, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, we've got to do the other, we've got to do blah, blah, blah. People at EU with all those skills and certificates are always going to get a berth. But the traditional way of, of success in sailing or to get on in sailing was to stand on the end of the dock, which we, you know, we did as kids, and literally, exactly, just find a boat that was short of one person. And the better the boat that you could find that was short of one person, the higher you could go up in your CV that weekend, and then you could say, oh, I was on, you know, Battle cry last weekend. I mean, you've only been cleaning out the heads where the, the, the holding tank broke, but at least they got you one, and then you can go the next weekend. And that is a very good way to go. We're all on the slightly more mature side, if I may say, in this room, and that may seem like an odd way to get ahead. But if you want to go on um, a, a China Sea race winning boat, if you get hold of Nick early enough and you are willing to, to be the cook, you've already heard, you know, you can almost certainly go. So. I, I would encourage everybody just to take baby steps. Don't try to go necessarily 3,000 miles in one hit. Uh, you can go offshore racing around Pedro Blanco Race if the Yacht Club ran a race around Pedro Blanco. And that first night, you'll feel like you've been across the Southern Ocean. And that is a really good start. Great, thanks. So before, I'd really like to get some other people to share who've been offshore racing who are here tonight. But before we do, are there any particular trials or tribulations that you've had when you've been offshore racing? How did you handle them? Anything in particular? There are too many to say. <laughs> you pick one. Is there one? So I did the China Sea Race in 2016, and I did that double-handed with Barry Hayes. And uh, that year was uh, a very windy race. Very windy. And um, we, we had... Two issues. That se second night was when it was gusting 40 to fi 50. We, we got knocked down by, by a wave, which wasn't that much fun. And after the knock knockdown, the two of us are sit sitting in the co cockpit, waves cra crashing around, um, pitch dark, pitch dark. And Barry turns around to me and, and he says, Nick, how many rigs have you lost? And I, I looked back, back at him and said, none. And then sat there for another five minutes. And then I turned around and said, why did you ask? And he said, oh, I'm just planning. I'm just thinking in my mind what we're going to do when we lose this rig. And I was like, oh. <laughs> well, let's hope we, we, we don't. And we didn't, thank, thankfully. But but there, there is someone who is actively on the boat, thinking about the situ situation and thinking about what to do should should the worst ha ha happen. So that is a very good person to be be, be with. The next thing was uh, the next morning we got through the storm. Everything was fine. The wind had ab ab abated a bit. Um, so as we were double-handed, we were allowed to use the autopilot. But all of a sudden, the autopilot stopped, work, stopped working, and the boat spun, spun, spun around. And it's like, oh, well, what's ha happened? Another pro problem. So I went downstairs to look, and, and the bolt that connects the autopilot run to the steering qu quadrant, that bolt had sheared. 
that had bro broken. So I looked, we looked at the bolt and okay, it was a special type of M12 bolt. So I then turned everything upside down on the boat, trying to find an M12 bolt that was not long enough, and I couldn't find anything. And at this point, Barry got really quite despondent. He was like, oh, you, you know, we've got another 36 hours. How are we going to survive? We've both got, got to drive. We're, we're, we're both really ex exhausted because we, we haven't slept. Um, so you know, what are we go going to do? And um, the point to, to the sto story is I said, I said to Barry, look, I don't know the, s the solution to this yet, but I guarantee you we will sol solve it because there is no pro problem that's unsolvable, and uh, we will sol solve it. So it took six hours to think of a s solution. Eventually, it was I found the, the ratchet ha handle of a spanner set. That that's all ra the, the ratchet handle. That was the same diameter as the, the hole, so, so I used that with that shit handle, except for the fact it was one of these cheap ch Chinese um, the, that shit handles that had a knurled edge. So the, the, the knurls on the edge were too, were, were, they made it too thick to fit through, through the thing. So then we spent two hours with a leather man filing down the knurls <laughs> on this thing so, so we could eventually put put it down, and and uh, it worked. And then, of course, the boat was covered in iron filings that were rusted and ruined the fiberglass. But anyway, there, there we go. No problem is uh, no, no problem can't be solved. Um, I, I'm going to be really short on trials and tribulations, and we're back to personal hygiene. Um, so one of the more irritating things as a girl where I tend to use, well, I use the heads. I know not everyone else uses the heads. The boys are generally peeing off the back of the boat when the conditions are fine. When the boat gets very lumpy, they come and use my heads. <laughs> and they can't aim properly. <laughs> so you're sitting it, down. They, well, clearly they're... Yeah, uh, so one of the so it's not it's not a trial and tribulation because it's a minor it's a minor thing. But one of the more irritating things is when you walk into your heads as the only girl on the boat to do the an attempt to try and keep clean, wash yourself, and you walk in there and there's just pee all over the wall, <laughs> all over the floor, and the little fuckers haven't cleaned up after themselves. So that was my that you know, was so which I think is a very minor trial and tribulation compared to what Nick has gone through. <laughs> Sitting down is a good rule onshore as well as offshore for men, but um, I'm not going to tr tr tribulation. I'm going to just say one thing. Um, or, or if, if, if the conditions are in the least bit unfavorable, wear a life jacket because it's a ridiculous way to die is to fall off a boat and drown. And the second one, if there's any wind, just wear a harness and clip on because if you're on the boat, the chances of being badly injured or, d or dying are very, very remote. If you fall in the ocean, the chances of dying go up so fast, it's unbelievable. If there's any breeze, if there's any waves, and you're in the ocean, fighting to someone to get the boat to come back and get you and fish you out is, is, is very difficult. You know, don't give up. If you do fall over, they may come back. But the, <laughs> the rule of life is do not, do not fall off this bloody boat. When my son did the single-handed fast in the uh, transatlantic race, my best friend in England, um, so I said, well, you know, give Oscar a call and give him some, give him some advice or give him a pep talk or something. He said, yeah, I'm going to go down to the boat and give him some advice. So he went down and got a big black marker pen and on the inside of the cockpit where he had to come up to, to each time to come onto deck, he got a big black marker and just wrote, just effing clip on. And every time Oscar came out of the, out of the, the boat into the cockpit, that's what he read. So life jacket and clip on and uh, you're, in pretty, you're in pretty safe space. Don't do those things and um, when it's windy. Even better, I can put you in the direction of a good life jacket company. Well said. Yeah. I think um, Clipper have extremely um, rigid training schedules. Uh, it's mandatory that everyone attends four weeks live-in training programs, and it's drummed into the standard operating procedures and the safety procedures. 
Um, fortunately, in all of the editions of the race, there's only ever been three deaths. And two of those were people who did not, A, clip on. So one girl just rushed out of the pit one night, into the pit one night to help um, in an emergency and didn't clip on. Hit by a wave, the first wave knocked her into the rails, the second rail, the second wave knocked her straight through the rails and she ended up in the ocean, in the North Pacific, in those conditions. Um, the boat approached her three times um, and on one occasion she managed to get her hands on the boat but by the time they recovered her she died of hypothermia. So that was a not clipping on. Um, it's really a funny thing that some people get it into their heads that clipping on or even wearing a life jacket is a wussy thing to do, a bit like taking a seasickness tablet. You don't really need to do that. But they are. They're really essential things. And if you play by the rules and do the right thing, um, you will save your life. I think there's a lot to be said for actually being responsible for your own safety gear as well. And if a Miss Clipper wearing their specific life jackets with a personal locator beacon and, and, and that was hooked to an AIS system. That was mandatory. Um, but any races that I do offshore, I use my own life jacket because I know it's history. Um, I've packed it, I know how it operates. I know instantly how I would operate that should I go overboard. And if you're in a position on an offshore race to actually be needing a life jacket, it's akin to a parachute, so it will save your life. Um, so I think those things are really important that you know how to check a life jacket. I always check the clipper ones as well. So you look at the cylinder, you inflate it a couple of days before you sail and make sure it actually stays inflated. Um, you pack it yourself so you know how it's packed. Um, all those things, if you want to do offshore racing, are really serious considerations. And I can't emphasize that enough. So is Lawrence. Uh, losing the rudder, steerage, um, Moon Blue 2, some of you know. Um, uh, we, we lost uh, the, the uh, steering cable sprang and we had to go down into the Lesserat at the back. So we had a chain gang to get all the crap out of the Lesserat that you have. So, and in the meantime, we had a, a young talent out of Australia who kept the boat, boat reaching uh, on the way to Vietnam, 26 knots, kept the boat sailing only on the sails without a rudder. And I was so impressed. So I think definitely make, ask your skipper to put really good people on that have all kinds of talents. <laughs> Great. So there are a few people here I know who've been offshore racing before. Does any of you would like to share, add anything to the conversation tonight? Carl, do you want to add anything? Do you want to share anything? Let me bring the microphone to you. I think I'd only echo the same point around around crew. So when we went up to the Philippines last time, some of the crew were, were new to the were new to the boat. So there was always that concern about whether the crew would gel. And I, and I must admit, for me, one of the highlights of the race was coming on watch at two in the morning. Worried about you know, the crew was big seas, you know, uh, four meter waves, windy, and seeing everybody grinning. And the only comment I got on a watch was person person on the helm said 14.2 knots. And I thought the crew had gelled. And, and when we finished the race, that was to me. I was, a friend of mine asked me, "What's that? again for you as a skipper?" He said, "Well, obviously nobody got hurt. Obviously a priority. Nobody, the boat didn't get damaged. But I think the way." as you said before, the crew came together. And I think that was made the race. You, we went from a crew of some people not knowing each other to a crew where I think whatever happened, you knew you could rely on everybody else to help get the boat or somebody else out of a particular situation. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Um, I suppose uh, two things that, that I, I think about. One on the personal hygiene thing, possibly worse than the uh, boys missing the toilet. I, I recall going down in the early hours of the one morning on a nasty night in Bass Strait um, to make coffee for, for the deck, uh, to find somebody um, had vomited in the sink. And I put my hand in the sink to fish out cups and things and wearing leather gloves to pick up a handful of somebody else's lunch, which uh, I, I've never found out who, but if I did, I'd hurt them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my gloves stank for a week. Um, 
But look, the, the big thing for me, and it, it gels with a number of things that have been said from the stage, is being prepared for the unexpected. Stuff will break. Uh, boats are complex things and you put them in a big wind and a big swell and things, things will fail. Um, having well practiced drills around how to solve some of the fairly predictable problems um, is critical to my mind. I uh, was on a boat that lost a rudder on the China Sea race a couple of years ago and uh, there was no predefined plan as to how to manage that and it became a very expensive and silly exercise getting back when a little bit of preparation could have actually let us finish the race. Uh, so you know, thinking through the basics, um, you know, loss of rig, loss of rudder, water ingress, all those sorts of things and, and understanding how to solve them uh, most, most times out of 10 is critical beforehand. Hi. Hi. Um, don't know if it's working. Yeah, you're on. Um, two, two tips. One uh, um, about seasickness. There is a, a very good product in Hong Kong, which is um, forbidden in other countries, which are scopolamine patches. To put around your, you know, behind your ear, um, which is the little portion of what during the war uh, was called the serum truth. So <laughs> you, you put this patch, this patch before the race uh, and prevent seasickness. You have to put it like one day before, even if you don't uh, suffer seasickness. But I was talking to like uh, Vendee Globe or Volvo racers. Um, most of them, they do uh, as a preemptive action. And it works. Every time I did an uh, ocean crossing, I put it, and I've never been sick at all. Mm. And <laughs> no, no, it, it just uh, it, it, it lasts for three days and it wears off. Um, you forget about having it. Panda no Pharmacy. Impact. You can get them in Panda Pharmacy. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they do sell it there. Yeah. And the second thing, as Nick said, um, uh, gear. You spend 1200 for your gear. Years ago, I decided to buy a dry suit, which was even more expensive, uh, which I used in Southern Ocean and North Pacific, and it really changed your life. Everything stays dry inside, socks, uh, whatever you want to wear underneath. I even stick like a uh, hot water bottle inside, which lasts for a few hours. And uh, you're in paradise. And if you go over, uh, you can inflate it. And it acts as a huge lifesaver, much bigger than your uh, life jacket. So it's a very, very well spent money. Thank you. Anyone else on this side who's done offshore racing before who'd like to share some thoughts and tips? Yeah, we're going to do questions a sec. But anyone? So. Thank you. Uh, I've done, done a few China Sea races, but I think um, I think my most memorable journey is actually crossing the Atlantic recently. Um, it was a boat, a catch, 42. We crossed from South Africa all the way to Caribbeans, and I found that I think Lucy's question, I mean, his com her comments about the bathroom, the heads. I think there's always a rule on the boat that whoever going to the toilet or the heads, it has to come out cleaner uh, for the next person. So that's always the rules. Even if you go to China Sea Race, I think it's always the case. I think that it's actually make it very, very good uh, with, with that rule. Um, the second, when I heard about Nick talking about having not been able to sleep for a few days, I think, I think the worst thing to happen is actually deprive of sleep because <laughs> Without any, without sleep, you can't really make a, a good judgment, and then, then, then um, you, you feel so tired, and then um, it, it's not easy um, um, to be able to take control of whatever is going to happen. Um, and thirdly, is actually the food. I think I think food is actually can raise the morale of all the crews, and I think that's why one of the reason I got <laughs> invited on board to be uh, on the boat. I love cooking and I enjoy fishing and, um, and, and I prepare all the food and, and you can actually see my presentation next week um, with my sharing of the uh, Atlantic crossing. So um, if you're looking for a crew, I'm actually happy to be, um, to be on the winning road. <laughs> Terrific. 
thanks. Anybody who has not been offshore racing before got any questions for folks here tonight? Hi, so obviously uh, doing coastal racing, now I heard they do one night, that sounds sensible, because you know, frankly, if you, if, if you took a lot of what you've heard, I'd be like, I'd be absolutely insane to do offshore racing, which is, which is what I, where I want to end up. So if, if you want to get into it, you know, we have our own boat, but we do coastal, so you start off as crew on offshore, you start off on one night or two night, what, what do you suggest? to build up, you do the re requisite courses? Because it's like, how do, how do you move from a social sailor to someone who can do offshore? Well, I think it, I just asked Lucy whether there was any, uh, sorry, Lucy, uh, Ingy, whether there's any offshore racing here overnights, which apparently there isn't because of lack of interest. So, no, we're Just to touch on the coastal racing, Lawrence obviously talked about how the local racing around the coast of Hong Kong could be just as valuable to get into things. We do have a coastal race series run from this club. There's five races. The next one's in December. One's already been run. Um, the plan is to try and get a Pedro Blanco in January, and there's another one in February and another one in May. Um, for the first race that was in September, we had five IRC boats. We had five under the new handicapping PHS system. So there's 10 boats have already been out on the coastal race. So have a look at the calendar and you can, and they're all tailored. So it's gonna start off as little baby races where you start in the sort of lunchtime, get into the darkness. So you get used to sort of a transition into darkness. And in those five races, it's all tailored to sort of have a bit of everything. Some longer races, some shorter races, but it will be obviously some nighttime stuff. And that's the most important thing to sort of just get used to sailing at night in Conditions you're not normally familiar with, but it's all on the Yacht Club website, so have a look, and it's a, it's a good starting point. So those are the dates, um, but one of the things I hear people say is it's really hard to get on a boat. How, how do you do that? How do you do that at the club? What's the best way? You don't know anybody who owns a big boat. You... Um, yeah, it's difficult. It's also difficult as an owner, founding crew, it really is. The club does have a crew web page uh, where, where you can start sign up um, to sort of say that you're available to crew. And I think you can also do the same, same way. If, if you're an owner, you, you can sign up and say you, you need crew. But I do look, look at that uh, web page periodically when I'm scratching around try, trying to find crew. Um, so, so, yeah. My, my suggestion for uh, individuals who want to uh, find a way onto a boat is actually to put your hand up for the delivery race back that will give you time on the boat, less stress, you know, a more relaxed owner who might have had a bit of sleep. Um, and that, and that, will give you, that will give you the experience without, without the racing conditions and will make you more interesting to an owner looking for a crew. Anyone else? I mean, is, is Saturday racing is always good because there are always people who come late. So if you're on the dock, you might just find someone who is short one and will take you. Um, quick question, actually, on the topic of sleep. Uh, um, again, wondering if the, uh, the panel could actually share a couple of tips. Uh, I, having done a few of these, uh, I found that actually being probably the number one uh, biggest issue for me, at least personally. Uh, and then that affects everything on a cascading order. So just very curious to see what, what patterns you follow before the race or during the race to actually get around uh, all of that. Because probably kind of plowing through three days, that's fine without sleep. Longer than that, you need uh, a plan. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a sleep is a good question. Um, there are lots of different types of watch systems that you, you can have, you know, three hours on, three hours off, four hours, three hours at night. Um, I, I've done them all, and, and for me, the most effective and easiest thing is this so-called buddy system, where, where you know, if you're double-handed, your buddy is obviously your other part, part, partner. If you're in a crew of six, you've got three pairs, and each pair just, you, you, you leave it up to each pair to sort, sort, sort out. 
So um, if you're feeling fine, you, you say to your body, you, you go downstairs and sleep. And you on the sail for three, four, four, four hours. And if you start to feel tired, tired, you go and wake your body up and say, "Come, come on, let, let, let's swap." And um, I, I found for for double handed weight racing that is def definitely the best um, because you know you, you can, if you're feeling fine, you can let let your body have a really good sleep. Really good. You can sleep for six six, six hours. Um, and and um, so that that works well. We did the body system on the China Sea race th this year, and what what I really liked about that is that if you do a rotation system, you only see half the boat. You only see your bit of the crew. Um, whereas if you do the the body system, the three pairs all seem to work on d d different times. So. As the owner of that boat, I, I, I managed to sail with everyone on, on, on the boat, and that's what you know, I enjoyed doing it. But, yeah, I, you, Claude, you mentioned fatigue, and, and fatigue is, well, obviously, you, you do sleep, but you don't sleep that, that, that well, and, and yes, you, you do end up being quite, quite fatigued. And, and this year's fast net race, we as we sailed down, down the coast on the one nice day we we had we had Radio Four on on, on the boat, so we were sailing along and we were listening to Radio Four. It was really nice. But I, I swear to you, all the way across the uh, uh, Irish Sea and all the way back, I could still hear Radio Four go, going on in my ears. Uh, because because you know you're so tired you're so f fatigued you sort of start to ha hallucinate and my hallucination was hearing noise at, at sea and in particular radio four so um, yeah that that's when you know you're fatigued. Any last oh. questions? You want to comment? No, I was. Want to comment? I double handed. I think is a is a world apart, and I I really do applaud. <laughs> Um, that ability to, to stay awake for that long and to just cooperate with one other person. But when you're on a, a large crew, um, a watch system is mandatory. We had a crew of 20 and we had two watches. So um, if you took the skipper out, you had uh, he, he didn't sort of have a watch, but you had half the people asleep and half the people awake working, obviously, and the whole goal is to optimise sleep. It was very, very hard, but some of the strategies I used, um, I had noise cancelling headsets, which the jury's out on that for me because if it's noise cancelling and you're in a deep sleep, you don't actually hear something that might happen in an emergency. So that's one thing to take into mind. But I found them really, really useful. I would drift off to sleep with some music as well, so I had a good playlist, made sure I packed a power pack so I could charge my phone so I could keep listening to music. Um, but trying to grab as much as possible. We hot bunked as well. Um, so one person would use the bunk and I found that being warm in my bunk was absolutely crucial. And water makes its way in anywhere. So a, a waterproof outer on your sleeping bag, like an ocean sleepwear, is, is gold. So you, you curl up, you're cosy, you're listening to some music and hopefully you can nod off. Um, crucial. large crew uh, with a four hours watch. Um, let's say you have 20, so you have 10 per watch. Um, do you, does your duty rotate um, amongst the crew or you just stay on the same duty all the time? Uh, no, you do rotate. You're actually expected to do a little bit of everything if you're crewing on, on a clipper boat. You have people who are primary people in their positions, like you have a bosun, have an engineer, you have a medic, so you have people who responsibilities are clearly delineated but we had a six hour on six hour off during the day and then three four hour watches during the night four hours on four hours off um what was the second part of your question but, but sorry how often do you rotate oh between jobs 
Uh, okay, every time you come on deck, say for example you are about to do a headsail change and on that the headsail is about 123 square metres and it's a heavy duty thing. So you need a lot of people. So you pull people from different parts of the boat to actually do that job. So there's not a dedicated team of people who will be always doing one thing. Um, if you need to help release a jib sheet, for example, then it, whoever's at that winch at that time will do that job. We would rotate the helm as well, um, which was really useful. Um, quite tricky, yeah. So yes, you got to do a bit of everything. But why don't you maintain the six hours on and six hours off in, during the night as well? Um, because we, 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 we found it actually during the South China Sea race. The six hours on and six hours is actually a better. Uh, with, we have eight crews, so four, four set of crews um, per, per, per ship. And mm -hmm. then you can actually get probably about five hours sleep. Um, that, that works actually better than if you get four hours or three hours watch and then you only get probably a couple, couple of hours. Yeah, I agree with you, but in the conditions that we were in, six hours on deck, each time you went on deck, would, would have just been a killer. Um, it was just hard enough surviving one hour or two hours, and then you would have to go down below, um, warm up somewhat, um, have a hot drink, get s switch out with someone else on deck. It was very, very hard to maintain that. It would be very hard to do that for a 24-hour period. Also, what we did though, to answer your question about other things, it, it, we would take one person from each watch for a full 24-hour period to be in charge of the galley and just general sort of clean up, disinfect down below. So it meant that, and actually I'm not the most domesticated person, but once a week that would be my turn and oh my goodness, that was just amazing because you actually did. Once you'd served breakfast, prepped lunch, you got to sleep. So you could sleep for four or five hours and that was absolute heaven. So I actually look forward to, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm on mother duty today. It's like, yeah, it's pretty well, actually, exciting. On, there's, there's a rule on the boat, I don't know whether it's true or not on other boats, but he said the cook doesn't need, really need to stay, not stay up for watch. But I, I didn't examine myself when I was going across the landing. I still, th I still did my watch, but my watch was fixed between 9 to 12. It doesn't rotate. The other crew have to rotate. Good. So, okay, we're, we're coming to a close. Um, could I just ask those who have been offshore racing before, could you put your hands up, please? So all of those people who haven't, if you ever need to ask any questions, have a look around. And those are the people to go and ask, OK, and get yourself involved. So just in closing, let me ask each person here on the panel, um, why do people go offshore racing? Why do you go offshore racing? Nick already shared a little bit at the beginning about that. But we've heard about the trials and tribulations and the difficult uh, parts of offshore racing. But what makes you keep going back? Shall I start? Please uh, do. Well, I kind of, I'm hoping I get an invitation to go back. Um, I would say it was probably one of the greatest adventures of my life, and it was amazing. Shit at times, but absolutely amazing. One of the best experiences I've ever done. It, you know, Nick's talked about the, the joy of being offshore. Wonderful. I highly recommend it to everyone. Go and, go and feel the power of the ocean. It just wonderful. Yeah. For me, it's the challenge. Uh, it, it's the cha cha challenge of not knowing what's going to get thrown at you, but knowing that something will. And, and the cha challenge of solving those pro problems is that's what's great, great about, about it. And then also, if you win, that also helps. <laughs> yeah, I only go for the race. I don't, I'm not interested in the challenges. With the, every challenge is a pain in the neck. Um, I just go for the race and the fact that two, I do mostly two-handed racing now, like Nick. Uh, doing it two-handed is an incredibly uh, fulfilling experience. But when you've done it with just one other person, I mean, you, you know, I've, done, I've started doing a bit of solo sailing on a J109. And when you've got the spinnaker up, you think, oh, my God, I've done really well. I've got it up. And as soon as you've got it up, you think, oh, my God, how do I get it back down again? <laughs> and with two-handed, it's pretty much the same. Um, Single-handed, you 
are not really racing at, at, at 100%, you're racing at about 85% because you've just got so much to do on your own. But two-handed, you're at 99% performance, and often you're performing better. I mean, the two-handers, some, I mean, the two-handed team won the fast net race against everybody a couple of years ago. And even this year, I think the top two-hander was 10th or 11th overall, something like that. So the two-handers are performing at 99.9% .9 of the fully crewed boats, which is an incredible um, testament, but uh, that, that's why I do it. Um, yes, I think what Nick and Lucy have said, it was the whole issue of getting to the end of a race with a team of people that you've worked with for a significant period of time and you've successfully crossed the finish line, hopefully with the same number of crew you started with, the boat's intact and the sails are almost intact. So it's just that extraordinary feeling of achievement that comes with facing sometimes a huge amount of adversity with a group of people that you've bonded with. So that's number one for me. But I have to say, if you've ever been gifted a full moonlit night under a sky full of stars with an ocean full of phosphorescence, phosphorescence in its wake, then um, you will know that there's unparalleled, it's unparalleled beauty and it's just something that's got to be experience to be believed. So. I also thought of the moonlight. Um, I did my first uh, three China uh, series crossings in X-99s until they got banned for being unsafe. Um, and that was where the salt between the toes never dried. Uh, then I've been really lucky in moving up in sizes and for the last 10 years I've been on Moon Blue. Uh, with a great uh, skipper, a great crew, and many of them have been coming back every year again. So it's, it's um, the fun, the camaraderie, and uh, of course you are on shifts, uh, three hours on, three hours off. So when you come, let's say, to the Philippines or Vietnam, you're right in party mode because you used to be sleep depraved. So the party just keeps on going. <laughs> Great. Well, I hope tonight's been helpful and useful and you've enjoyed yourself. Um, please let us know if there are other subjects you'd like to cover in this series. We'd um, be glad to hear from you. But can we please say a big thank you to our panelists tonight? I think it was just really terrific, the sharings that we had. <laughs> If anyone's got any more questions, some of us are heading into the main bar now. Come and join us. And just as um, we're leaving tonight, we've got a couple of clips from uh, Nick's Fastnet experience um, in the summer that we're going to show. But anyway, thank you very much for coming and supporting this event tonight. Well done, Elaine.
What to do for the next 24 hours? Minutes howling, howling outside. It's really pretty, pretty on the. So, what do you do? We also find out on. It's driving the boat quite nicely. So, there's nothing else to do other than sit inside. Yeah, it's good money. Yeah, it's good chilling out. As am I. This is the. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but this is the routing. The red dot there is the routing, and the green dot just above it is where we are. So, pretty much, I don't know where it's going to be. I know, I know. There is money. All these other ones. That's what we can see on the GIS. The enemy, the enemy is. Hunter, the German boat. There were 10 or 11 miles behind her. Now we've caught up. And we're on the right side of the wind. That's so that's big step. So at the moment, we're in there. We're only doing something here. It is a lovely outfit. Whoever was actually driving me around. Um, Can you see it up there? No. Thank you. 